Jim Murray is Jim Murray lives right here in South Portland. Um, he is a um, not an associate professor. Adjunct. Adjunct professor. Never mix those up. Uh, of art at uh, the community college here. Um, his work has been shown widely around the country. It is art revolving in part around quantum physics. And Jim is a friend of the Starborn Support family. I couldn't think of a better way to start off the day than with him. And being first up is always a courageous position. Um, I used to think that it was, oh, you're the new guy, you know, we'll sacrifice you because everybody's hung over from the night before. I now understand it is something of a compliment that you put up an intriguing speaker first and you have a chance of getting a few more people out of bed. When I said Jim and I have something in common, I began my professional life as a painter and I taught painting for uh, more than a dozen years at New York's Distinguished School of Visual Arts, my alma mater, as well as another art program, before my career completely derailed into becoming a ufologist. However, I am very pleased to begin our day by introducing my new friend, artist, James Murray. My name is James Allen Murray. I'm an adjunct professor here in South Portland, as I, Peter had mentioned. I did not plan to talk like this the entire time for you. And I just thought it'd be fun too. Um, so, good morning, everyone. I hope you're adequately caffeinated. And uh, I'd like to start off by first and foremost thanking Starboard Support and Audrey. What a great job. And I, I, I help as much as I can throughout the year, so um, I know she puts, uh, I know they all put a lot of work and effort into this um, conference, and I hope being the third year we've started a trend enough to make it something that can be carried throughout uh, quite often and for a long time. So, My artwork being based on science, um, I do teach woodworking sculpture. Um, my MFA thesis was based on quantum theory, particle physics, wormholes, um, theoretical physics, astrophysics. Um, so it's the scientific aspect of my artwork is really holds true and dear to my mentality and what I think about quite often. Um, for the longest time, I was skeptical 
about all things paranormal, or as Stephen Bassett would have me say, normal. <laughs> and that was a great, that was a, a, a fantastic presentation last night. I was really honored and happy to see that. Um, so, the artwork that this is, is just basically two sculptures. The, the one on the, the right hand side, I can walk under to give you an idea of the scale of it. And it's how theoretical physicists describe a wormhole, where we can bend space and time and travel vast distances from one part of the universe to the other. Um, so another aspect of that makes me realize, well, if it's a theoretical physicist that's coming up with the idea of a wormhole, then, you know, who's to say what what happens with craft and how that travels from one aspect of the universe to the other um, to get here. You know, you have the arguments from the skeptics that say it can't possibly be done, but we don't know that. From the current understanding that we have, yes, but we, we don't um, understand much as you see. Um, also, a great deal of my artwork and what I've researched and makes me um, really passionate about this is the, the things that we cannot see, but we know are there. The, the astrophysics about the planet Earth, um, magnetosphere, uh, we do know that that's there, we can't see it though. And the fact that we can't see it doesn't mean that it doesn't exist on a regular basis. It's there. We have the proof that it's there. Um, how do we have the proof? Well, it produces the northern lights. When particles from the universe and space hit our magnetosphere, we see the northern lights, or which is also called the aurora borealis, and that's my depiction of the magnetosphere based on and entitled the Aurora Borealis. Um, so you can see that my mind and my artwork gravitate more towards the scientific. But here was the game changer for me um, growing up in a very typical blue collar family. Um, when I heard about this experiment, the double slit experiment, it, it really altered what I thought was normal and how things worked. Um, briefly, it's just, as you can see, when we shoot a photon through two slits, the top, it acts as a particle. It acts as one independent piece. That's when we look at it. That's with conscious observation. When we don't look at it, as you can see on the bottom piece, it acts like a wave. So that's how you see the, the remnants of that experiment altered from one aspect to the other. And this is proven. This is consistently proven through scientific, <coughs> excuse me, scientific experimentation. So if our consciousness and our observation of particles in the universe depends on how they act, it, they depend on, their behavior depends on how we observe them and if we observe them. So from that point on, I, I, I go along with the mentality of we don't know what we don't know then. And not knowing what we don't know is a very difficult place for me to be to make art with. Um, I try to reach out to people that are interested in galleries and the art field and professors that will listen. Uh, and I see with the culture that I try to show my artwork around, 
They prefer to see it just as objects. They don't want to hear the explanation, and that's fine. But over time, I would like, just like you all, to have the word spread about what you're experiencing with your consciousness. And that's why it's imperative that more groups and more people come out and talk about what they've seen, what they know they've experienced. And as, um, as just living in the United States and just being a part of this culture, I can see daily that we're distracted. Um, we're distracted from our own consciousness, we're own, our own environment. You know, we're wandering around, driving around, not seeing what's up in the sky. You know, we're, we're pretty well caught up, as you can see here. And, um, you know, I'm guilty of both of that. And I uh, hope there's no police in there. <laughs> um, it's not against a lot of heat, but doesn't that look a little more dangerous than being on the phone? Um, so, we're distracted. We're distracted from minute to minute. When we get home after, you know, you could be driving into work and then grabbing a bite on the way home. And then we're distracted by TV and what they tell us to watch, what we're enjoying. And you know, with all of the things that I'm saying we're distracted by, I am too. I might not watch Dancing with the Stars or American Idol, but I have my own niche that I like to distract myself with and that's okay. But I do have, quite a bit of um, interest and drive to find out more about what I opened with to make my art work about. I do have quite a bit of understanding of the theories of science and the theories that we go with um, and proceed forward with in the scientific field. Um, So, I have notes and I haven't had to look at them, that's great. <laughs> so, more distraction, you know. I'm not a particular baseball fan, my, my son plays football, I watched that for him. Um, personally, I like to tour France. Um, but, it's still distractions. It's still pastimes. It's still consciousness and what we share, and how we relate to one another. And what, you know, the, the fact that I said, I'm not a big football fan, but my son plays it. I'm not a huge baseball fan, but that's the American pastime. And then there's people thinking, how can you not like baseball? And there's that categorization right there of, oh, okay. Um, and that's, I'm comfortable enough excluding myself from those groups of not really caring about football, not really caring about baseball. Because, to be quite frank, I care more about quantum physics than the Patriots. You know, and I can hear a bus starting up in Boston right now, coming for me. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's, um, that's, that's where I'm at. I mean, it's social constructions and fitting in and, you know, more distraction. I can stay at home in a living room with my wife, two twin 11-year-old stepdaughters, and my 13-year-old. And they'll pick a show for us to watch. And I get to sit there, watch a show that I'm not interested in, while my wife is on her phone flipping through it, while the kids are on their iPads and Kindles. And they're engaged in the TV, and the screen in front of them, and it's distracting. You know, I, I see that. I can relate to that. And it's not that I'm bashing it. It's not anything other than what I'm just stating, that we are distracted. And that distraction is also how we relate and identify. So, I did go to grad school in Texas, and they do like the Dr. Pepper, I have to say. Um, the first Hooters that I was ever at was in Florida. So, um, you being here in Maine, LL 
well-being, definitely a connection there. So it is. It's, it's how we relate and identify with each other. Uh, culture, brand names, products, and religion. Now, it's feeling, it's, it's that group connection forming the strong bond. I feel that when I get up and go to church on Sunday, which I don't do, um, there's that a connection with people. There's a connection with you that I feel. Um, and thank you for getting up so early and hear me rambling on my tangent. Um, but you don't want to upset this group, whichever one is on here. Um, and that's, that's the dilemma that I've found that Audrey has to work with is what about this group, right? We have a drawing here by Chuck Fultz, a uh, good close personal friend of Jim Wiener who will be um, pulling the finale this evening. And um, it'll be a great, great presentation. But, you know, for those of you that have experienced things, It's very, very difficult <coughs> to comprehend. And it's, the experience forces a disconnection to society that you don't want to share it. You feel like you're wandering around alone. And you're not alone because Starborn support is here. There's, there's other places that you can go to fit in and not feel so badly about it. What you, what you can't deal with on your own. Um, and it's helpful, you know, Audrey and Starborn support, the radio station, um, everything that they do. <coughs> Excuse me. So, with the constant distractions, it's easy to be denied. If this is your normal, and this is the only things you know, that it's very, very difficult to swallow a story or even an experience of this magnitude and being contacted. Um, so it's not normal. It's it's a dilemma, um, and. You have a comfort zone here being, having that tunnel vision. And, you know, they call paranormal fringe sciences. And, you know, it's, it's a difficult situation to be in if this is all you know and someone else that you know has an experience that's outside of your normal. Then you have the question of, okay, do I believe them? Do I believe me? Do I believe what I saw? And the, the question is very hard for people to answer sometimes, and very hard to work up the strength and courage to ask for help. Which, like I just stated, Audrey and Star Wars Support did a great job putting together quite a bit of compassionate and relative <laughs> help. So, wow, I have been up here for 15 minutes, all right, okay. Great. And, you know, being my first time, in case you couldn't tell, um, I wasn't sure if I was gonna be real, real short, but it looks like I'm gonna probably be right on time. I'll be make sure I'm right on time. So then you have denial. You know, fear to accept it yourself and especially others. But, you know, what if you're a credible source? What if you hear it from a credible source? What determines a credible source? So there's plenty of cases that have been observed by police officers as well as multiple people. And that, that test 
testimony from all of them would lead to a conviction in the court of law. Multiple accounts, same facts, guilty. But not with the UFO topic, not with the extraterrestrial topic. Um, deny. And there's categories and what makes denial comprehensible for the groups, the masses, society that is eating the cheeseburger, talking on the cell phone while, you know, watching American Idol. It's safer. It's more comfortable to deny even a credible source, you know? If it goes against the fundamental religion that you practice staunchly, then of course you're not going to um, want to accept that. Believe it. Forget being convinced. It's less work. It's just easier not to believe that. And that's what we've been trained to do as the society. Um, so what makes something undeniable? Well, it's a large enough group with accepted, accepted witnesses is credible. The person that you know to be level-headed and mentally sound, multiple witnesses, the time of day, so there's no confusion, the distance of said object, its characteristics while being observed. If it can't, if it doesn't act like an airplane, it's not an airplane. And then you have belief. If you have a credible witness and all the other categorized checklists convincing facts. So, we're back to we don't know what we don't know. And I say we as the collective public and cultural society of the United States and many other Western countries. So, and that goes into science and nature and many other topics. We just simply still do not know everything there is to know. And that's why the artwork that I showed you earlier was based on things that we can't necessarily see. Because even with the spectrums that we can see, there's other spectrums that we know things exist in. You know? Infrared. We can't see that. But there's things that we were witnessing through inf infrared cameras. Um, going back to this slide. Now, <coughs> We're doing millions, if not, I'm sure Stan would be able to tell me if it's billions on CERN and particle colliders um, to figure out what the quantum particle does and how many there are. And more importantly, you know, we, we did confirm finally the Higgs boson, you know, that, that magical subatomic particle that makes sense of it all. But, Here's my question about that. Even. If this is true, and we've proven it to be so, how do we know when we collide those particles together that they're not doing an act for us as we observe them? How can we possibly know? So then we get into what's our reality? what's normal, and it's our consciousness as a group that we accept things. So when there's, um, when there's, a, when there's a, a riff or a departure from what the group has accepted, it's harder to swallow. But it doesn't mean that it's false. Um, I did put that in twice, <laughs> but 
here's, here's why I wanted to get back to this as far as my own checklist. You know, so a credible witness. We all judge a credible witness differently. Um, juries judge a credible witness differently. Lawyers want to discredit a witness if it's not comfortable for their case, whereas the other want to increase their viability as a witness if it helps their case. And that's that's what, you know, we do quite often when we hear something that's uncomfortable, that goes against our core belief. Um, and that's that's quite tragic, in my opinion. Um, so then multiple witnesses, time of day, distance and observation, observed characteristics. So the cynical, critical thinking, artistic rendition of everything that I look at, I, I, I think about the chairs that you sit in down to the atomic particle that they're consisting of, and then blow it all the way up into the vast universe and its expanding nature. So we all can agree that the Big Bang happened and that the universe is expanding. So at that point, I have always I have asked myself this for years, this is expanding, what's on the other side of that expansion? We don't know. Um, so what's on that other side is a mystery. But my critical thinking became seeing as believing on July 31st of this year. <coughs> so July 31st, Lovewell Pond, that's an hour from here, Freiburg, <coughs> Maine. It was 10.30 at night, and I do have the map up, which I would like to show everybody. So, here we are on a nice day in South Portland and Portland. Freiburg is right in this vicinity. So, So as I was at a campfire, with what I saw. 
I want to be just told it was a drone. So then I know. I don't want that mystery of what could it have been? What was it? Um, and, you know, initially I, I, I had problems telling family members. And had I seen that craft alone, I might not have discussed it, which is too bad. Um, so, just a, one final point that I wanted to uh, put some relevance on and a connection to is being on Lovewell Pond here in Maine and Freiburg, um, we can see in um, close proximity. From where I was standing and the direction I was looking at, it was over the White Mountains that I saw the craft. Um, and I know we've heard of a couple of other accounts that were in that area. Um, so it might have been one of the 28 out that night. So mm -hmm. thank you. Thank you.